another glorious day when we get to share knowledge and give you maximum entertainment here at Adventist World Radio, the Voice of Hope. This is New Life Program, brought to you by Tileno Dia. In today's program, we have a lot of great items in store for you, dear listener. To start with, we'll be giving you some of the ways in which one should follow in order for him or her to have a happy marriage. Pastor Tom will also be sharing with us on a topic known as a well of tale. Before all that, let's, uh, let us listen to some music. This is the Voice of Hope. There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest. And the beautiful home shall be born. Oh, that wonderful Eden so blessed. Where Jesus the Master has gone. To prepare us this glorious home. They bids us a welcome to In today's 
life, most of us are involved in different kinds of relationships and some of them do not last long. Betty Anyago is here to share with us on the biblical rules for a happy marriage. Stay put. You can get the best advice in the world, but if you don't apply it, you won't receive the benefits. Yes, in marriage, there are two partners involved and it's difficult to follow the advice if your partner won't help in the process. But more often, it's a matter of us not wanting to do the work it will take. Or we think we are the exception to the rules. Or we procrastinate until things get exceptionally complicated to fix. Or we only want to do it if our partner will do what we believe they should do. And it's true. There is a lot of validity in all of those arguments as far as why we aren't following good advice. But as the famous saying goes, how's that working for you? If your marriage is better because you aren't taking someone's advice, then you're probably wise. But if your marriage isn't doing well, then it will be good to follow it even if you don't want to. The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 12:15. We'd like to share with you some wise advice that is based on biblical principles which we believe will help your marriage if you follow them. As with any rules, there are usually exceptions that can be made unless they come directly from God himself. This is especially true when you see the word never. But don't get stuck on that word. Look at the context of the rules and honestly look to see if God may be telling you that this advice will help your marriage when applied. So the following are 10 biblical rules for marriage put together by author and counselor Steve Atterburn from www.newlife.com. Dr. Atterburn writes, Here are 10 lessons from scripture that will be sure to enrich your marriage. Meditate upon them and ask God to help you prayerfully, wisely, lovingly and creatively put them into practice. Number 1. Never bring up mistakes of the past. Stop criticizing others or it will come back on you. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Luke 6:37. A good rule in working out differences is to refrain from being hysterical and historical with each other unless you see that it will help your marriage do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen ephesians 4:29 think will this help or hurt your marriage before you say it you might feel better for having said it but at what cost Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 4:31 to 32. Number 2. Neglect the whole world rather than each other. We may think our spouse can put up with neglect for good reasons. But don't be so sure that if our courts are filled with such cases. Think about it. What does it benefit you if you get all or most of your to-do list accomplished but your marriage relationship fails because of neglect? If you're finding yourself oppressed by piles of tasks that never seem to get done, I encourage you to join me in making a renewed commitment to daily prayer. These days I'm praying, Lord, I need your wisdom to sort out the important things from the urgent. Be sure you know the condition of your flock. Give careful attention to your herd, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for generations. Proverbs 27:23 to 24. Number 3. Never go to sleep with an argument unsettled. 
and don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Ephesians 4:26 to 27. Sometimes it may be best to agree to reapproach a problem the next day because you are not able to resolve it at that time. But don't go to bed stewing about it either. Agree to leave the situation alone that night and approach it the next day with a fresh approach. This has helped us many times. Number four. At least once a day, try to say something complimentary to your spouse. Gentle words bring life and health. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 15 verse 4. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Proverbs 25 11. Number 5. Never meet without an affectionate welcome. Kiss me again and again. Your love is sweeter than wine. Song of Solomon 1 verse 2. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13 12. This is by far my favorite rule for a happy marriage. It's called the 10 second kiss. It's a great way to leave the house in the morning and to come home in the evening. Try the 10 second kiss tomorrow. Or better yet, today. But even if you are not into kissing in your culture, ensure you express affection openly in your own style to your spouse. 6. For richer or poorer, rejoice in every moment that God has given you together. A bowl of soup with someone you love is better than steak with someone you hate. Proverbs 15.17 We know so many widows and widowers who live in the if if onlys of regret that they didn't do more celebrating, embracing each moment together rather than taking them for granted. Today is a gift. That is why it's called the present. 7. If you have a choice between making yourself or your mate look good, choose your mate. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Proverbs 15:17 Have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. 8. If they are breathing, your mate will eventually offend you. So learn to forgive. I am warning you. If another believer sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Even if he wrongs you 7 times a day and each time turns again and asks for for forgiveness, even if he wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, forgive him. Luke seventeen three to four. One sinner plus another sinner equals two sinners. Double trouble under one roof. In the covenant of marriage, God asked two self-willed sinners to come together and become one flesh, not in body only, but in spirit, in attitude, in communication, in love. It is a life challenge. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3.13 9. Don't use faith, the Bible, or God as a hammer. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. John 3.17 10. Let love be your guidepost. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and keeps no record of when it has been wronged. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-5 We pray these rules will release your marriage to new heights of understanding. In case you have just joined us, thank you for tuning in. This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I am your host, Tileno Diambo. Give us your views, comments, and suggestions about this program by writing to the producer, Adventist World Radio, PO Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.com. 
give way for Pastor Tom Nyarunda to enlighten us more on the Bible segment on a topic known as a well of tale. Be blessed. Hello, my listener. In the next uh, five or so sessions, we're going to have a discussion on one of the books in the Bible that has basically been forgotten, the book of Jonah. This book has about 48 verses, but in it we can pull out important lessons that will help you as you grow in your Christian life. Our message today is entitled, A Well of a Tale. Now, what is the most wicked city in the world? Is it Nairobi, Mombasa, Kampala, Dar es Salaam, or is it Kinshasa, or could it be Bujumbura? or wherever you could be living in. Suppose God sent you to that city and tells you you are to warn them that in little over one month their sinful city will slip into the ocean in a massive earthquake if they do not repent of their sinful lifestyle and accept Jesus as their Savior. Would you go on such a mission? Many of us would actually not go. In the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1 up to 2, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. When God calls, he is specific. Jonah lived almost 2,800 years ago near the Sea of Galilee. When God called him, even though his name means dove, he acted more like a scared dog with its tail tucked between its legs running off to hide. But remember, you cannot hide from God. When God calls us, he always has a specific purpose. When God called Isaiah, he said, Here I am, send me. But when God called Jonah, he said, Here I am, but God, please send somebody else. People have not changed much since Jonah's time. We are sailing for Tashish when God has called us to go to Nineveh. Jonah was a real person who lived in a real city just like us. He knew God and realized it was really God who was calling him to a wider ministry. Has it ever occurred to you that Jonah's God is still alive today and still calls his people today? Has God prompted you and attempted to, to direct your life to some place recently? I will never forget the time God called me into ministry. I was ill-equipped for the ministry, but since that time I have learned something about God, that God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the persons that he calls. God knows you, and any time he calls you, he usually is very specific. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, expresses how the city of Nineveh was. It was a city full of blood, piles of corpses, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, harlots, sorceries, prostitution, plunder, fears and cruel. You name it, in Nineveh, they even burnt their children alive. 
they tortured adults by skinning them alive and leaving them to die in the burning sun. The more Jonah thought about it, Nineveh was a good place to stay away from. Yet God was calling Jonah to Nineveh, but Nineveh was not on his preaching schedule. Jonah couldn't believe God wanted to save those wicked sinners. The ancient Jews knew that God loved them and them alone. To be called to go to Nineveh was a shock to the preacher Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Go and preach against that city. God is never vague. When you do God's will, you know it. Jonah was not given any options. Go to Nineveh and preach against that city. He was not to go for a city of his choice, not to preach philosophy or pious platitudes, not to set up a van ministry or call for work. Jonah was go to the very scene of city and preach for all he was worth against their wicked ways and to uphold the true God. God is still calling his people, but unfortunately, the modern vacation cruise line called Princess Tashish is doing big business in the church today. You have a hard time speaking out against pornography. If you yourself subscribe to Lustful magazines, you can't badmouth wicked theaters or X-rated movies if you regularly feed on the afternoon soap operas. You cannot uphold the standard against alcoholism if you drink a little wine. So Jonah decided to run from God. In the third verse of chapter 1, the Bible says, But Jonah headed for Tashish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. The first two words of this verse are the saddest words in the whole book. Jonah did just the opposite of God wanted. Jonah stuffed his bag with some clothes and took all the money he had and hurried 60 miles down to Joppa, where there was a seaport. At the dock, he got out his Rand McNally Atlas. The map showed Nineveh 700 miles to the east, the prodigal son went to a far country. In verse 3, the Bible says, He found a ship bound for Tashish. Friend, you also find a ship ready and waiting. It's a marvel that the devil always has a ship waiting, that it is so easy to disobey. But if you are en route to Tashish when God has called you to go to Nineveh, you can be sure that a great storm is brewing. And the sooner or later, you will be overboard. Your life is in jeopardy. Just when he wanted to disappear away from God, he found a ship ready going a different direction. Does it sound familiar? If, for example, a young Christian girl marries an unsaved man just because he happened to be there, she is like Jonah, running away from God, simply because there was a ship ready to take her to the direction she wanted to go. Notice his downfall. When you choose to leave the sure path of God's will, you begin a long downward trail that leads to disaster, down, down, down into sin. Running from God is very expensive, my friend. Jonah paid the fare. Sin is very costly. Jonah paid the ticket. That is how sin is. We pay our own way when we flee from God. It cost Jesus his blood. Romans 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. The cost of living God is very steep. Stay close to Jesus and you are going to be safe. Ask the prodigal son standing there in a hog mud, handing out the husks about the cost of living God, and he will tell you it is quite expensive. What about the prostitute in the street, who is only 20 but looks 40? He will, she will tell you the cost of living God is very expensive. What about the alcoholic and the drug addict? They will tell you the cost of living God. You get some idea how expensive it is when you see a haggard face of men on the street that are paying the fare. Others are hooked on crime. The most expensive thing a person can ever do is to run away from God. They lose their family, their job, 
and their reputation, their happiness and peace. How different Jonah's life could have been. How many troubles he could have avoided by surrendering to God. How hard it was for him to pay the price for living God. How wonderful it is for us today to know that our wonderful Savior Jesus Christ pays it all. Salvation is completely free of cost to those who accept Jesus as their Savior. If you have been running away from God, I appeal to you right now to return to him today. Give your heart to Jesus. Accept his gift of eternal life. He will take your life of sin and give you his pure robe of righteousness. He died our death that we might live his life. Don't be a Jonah and pay for your own sin. Sin will cost you eternal life. Let Jesus pay the full cost. My friend, is God calling you today? When he calls, answer, Here am I, send me God. Remember Jonah said, Here I am, please send somebody else. Let God's will be your will. Choice and not chance determines our destiny. God had a problem with Jonah and so have I. My plan is to preach a few sermons as we go on with this series. Thank you for listening and may God bless you. That brings today's program to a closure. It is always a privilege having your company and I'm looking forward to it on our next show. Thanks and remember to send us your views, comments and suggestions regarding this program to the producer, Adventist World Radio, PO Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. On behalf of the producer, I have been your presenter, Tilano Diambo. There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest. And the beautiful home shall be more. Oh, that wonderful aid and so blessed. Jesus, the master, has gone to prepare us this glorious home. They bid us a welcome to come. Oh, what a Lord, just a cross in that beautiful cloud, when the angels sweet Oh, oh, oh.